Tuesday, September 13th. And who said Brits aren't sentimental? We start here. The UK pays homage to Queen Elizabeth as her coffin makes its way to its final resting place. Some of these towns only have a few hundred people in them, yet thousands of people showed up. What the crush of crowds are telling us about a mournful nation. The government might not track which guns you've purchased, but could a credit card company? They could flag that to authorities and, you know, potentially try to get ahead of something, you know, horrific happening. Pressure on banks has led to a significant development. <laughs> And they say a famine's not on the way, it's already arrived. Her husband died on yeah, the way yeah. to try to come to this yes, camp. Yes. Inside the disaster unfolding in Somalia and why the next few weeks could be even worse. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. You know the phrase, keep calm and carry on? You've probably seen it on a poster somewhere. That phrase was originally seen on posters during World War II in Britain, but those posters weren't really circulated that much. In fact, the phrase wasn't widely used until a copy of those posters was found just 20 years ago, which I didn't know. I'd assumed it was always just said because it seems so perfectly British, right? Specifically, it seems to embody everything about the Britain that Queen Elizabeth II ruled over. Keep calm and carry on. It was as if she was practicing that slogan every day of her reign. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. Well, over the last few days, as the body of the fallen queen toured the Scottish countryside, it became clear this would not be business as usual. There was no stiff upper lip here. People have swarmed towards her coffin, often unable to hold back their tears. And today, that coffin will be on its way to London. ABC's foreign correspondent Maggie Ruley actually has a unique perspective here because she was at Balmoral the day Elizabeth died. Since then, wherever the fallen queen has gone, Maggie has followed. She's in Edinburgh right now. Maggie, what's fascinating is that if the Queen hadn't died in Scotland, we likely wouldn't have seen so many of these extraordinary scenes. Mm. So what have we missed? Yeah, exactly, Brad. That's what's so amazing about all of this. You know, they call it Operation Unicorn. That's what we've been seeing unfold. This this whole procession of the Queen's coffin traveling from her beloved Balmoral down to Edinburgh. And when we talk to Scottish people on the ground, I'm shocked by how much it's meant to them. I'm very sad about this. Uh, I'll never see another queen like her. Never. So many of them have told me that it almost feels as if this whole thing was meant to be. Like, the, the queen made this decision. She chose to pass away in Scotland just so that this would happen, just so that she would have one final chance to say goodbye to the Scottish people, give the Scottish people one last chance to be close to her again. For people around here in Deeside, they were just a neighbour in the community. You know, they were just part of the, the, the wider kind of community family. And you mentioned that emotion, Brad. I mean, we cannot stress this point enough. The weight of the moment is not lost on anyone. We have uh, gone along the entire route with Queen Elizabeth in this motorcade, starting in Balmoral, making our way down to Edinburgh. And along the entire route, thousands of people. And Brad, what's so amazing about this is, you know, when she made that trip down from Balmoral, she was snaking through backcountry roads, through small Scottish towns. It took six hours. Some of these towns only have a few hundred people in them, yet thousands of people showed up. It's very sad, it's very emotional. Um, and just to feel that amongst everybody who's here and to hear the journeys that some of the people who have made to be here, um, I think is really special. I mean, that's an incredible statement to, to what Queen Elizabeth meant to the Scottish people. And, and when she drove past Brad, you know, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but everyone just fell silent. Thousands of people, a huge crowd, and you could hear a pin drop. I think everyone really wanted to just spend this moment being together with their queen. As one woman put it, she said, you know, I wanted to be here to be near my queen one final time, to feel her spirit one final time. And so we gather to bid Scotland's farewell to our late monarch. She's lying in state here for 24 hours in Edinburgh. This is really a chance for 
that all the Scottish people to, to come and have that final moment with their queen. And authorities are saying they're getting larger numbers than they expected. Last we checked, it was more than a mile long in the line, tens of thousands of people waiting, many of them getting there at the crack of dawn, waiting through the night, Brad. This is a 24-7 operation. And this is just sort of a glimpse of what we're expecting to happen in London. Because after those 24 hours wrap up later today, uh, the queen's coffin is going to board a Royal Air Force airplane. They're flying the queen down to London, where then tomorrow there'll be a similar procession like we saw in Edinburgh through the streets of London, bringing her to once again lie in state, this time for four days in London. Overnight, four days, 24 hours a day, uh, the police in London have already said people should expect to wait in line for up to 20 hours. And Maggie, like, I'm thinking now, you're an American who's now lived in the UK for several years at this point. What has it been like to talk to people, I guess, around the country about their queen? Yeah, Brad, it's been so interesting. And I think as an American, it's very challenging to totally understand and grasp what the queen, what the monarchy means to a nation. I think you always feel a little bit like an outsider when you haven't grown up with the monarchy. The queen um, means so much to everyone. Um, I'm born in the UK and um, so I've only known the queen all my life um, and um, just her sense of duty and everything um, is just just demands my respect. And right just now, when, when I talk to British people, for many of them, you know, they're grieving the loss of this woman that's been a constant, a woman that many of them thought of kind of as their grandmother. But there's also this sense of, of losing some of their national identity and questioning where it's going to come from next. This is just so different to be seeing, you know, the Queen's head on our currency for so many years and then for it to be replaced with King Charles. With this potential struggle in this new transition and what it means for themselves personally as well as for the country. Yeah, and I think the rawness of the reactions here, like you said, have really kind of shaped what we know about how emotionally connected a large part of this population was with their queen. Maggie Rooley there in Scotland. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Next up on Start Here, back in the U.S., a distinctly American problem with perhaps a very American next step. We're back in a bit. This is ABC News Live. It's the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. 
The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Later today, the new consumer price index will be unveiled, telling us just how much more expensive some items have become. But another piece of interesting financial news happened this weekend, and it reminds you that even as Americans press lawmakers to end legislative deadlocks, sometimes it's pressure campaigns on private companies that can push the ball even further. Visa announcing today they will begin categorizing sales at gun shops separately. It's that seems to be what's happening in the world of gun purchases right now. ABC's Elizabeth Scholz, he covers the economy. You probably haven't heard her for the last few months because she's been off raising a child. Elizabeth Schulze, welcome back. You had a baby in this economy. I had a baby. He is so excited about this CPI report today, Brad. All about the inflation <laughs> data. I cannot wait to dig into it, just like me. <laughs> so so help me understand this story then, because on the surface, this is like a, a, a super wonky story. You got this credit card company, Visa, recategorizing gun sales, but both sides of the gun debate says this is actually a really huge development. Why? Yeah, absolutely, Brad. You know, what this is is a big win for activists who were really pushing credit card companies like Visa to play a more active role in trying to curb what are seen as suspicious gun sales. So basically what we're talking about here, when you go to a purchase and you go to a store, when you buy something with your credit card, the purchase from that store falls under what's called a merchant code. So if you go buy groceries at Whole Foods, the retailer Whole Foods that has a groceries merchant code. And like there's merchant codes for like every kind of retailer, nail salons, hair salons, shoe shine parlors, mm. all sorts of these merchant codes. But there hadn't been a merchant code for gun retailers. So if you went and bought a gun mm. with your credit card or debit card from a gun store, that purchase actually fell under a sporting goods merchant code or even a general merchandise code. Obviously buying like a camping tent or a tennis ball, that is very different than buying a gun. Whether you're getting a car repair, whether or not you attend a nail salon, every business tracks credit card transactions in this nation. And so I don't think um, it would be difficult to create a unique merchant code that reports a purchase for a gun. So there had been this push from activists, even from some banks, this union-owned bank called Amalgamated Bank was kind of behind this push too, to basically create this merchant code for gun sales that would clearly label these sales as credit card transactions as guns. And what that would do is then make it easier to track suspicious activity related to gun sales kind of falling under a pattern. Yeah, I, I was trying to understand, why would that matter to recategorize them? Like what would what difference would that make? Right. So what this would allow the credit card companies to do is to note patterns or changes in behavior that then they could flag to authorities to potentially investigate those sales. So um, so the example here that's used, credit card companies already do this for other financial crimes like fraud or embezzlement or human trafficking. So think of this like 
If someone is using credit card transactions frequently along the same route of the highway in high dollar amounts, spending those monies at motels, gas stations, and fast food restaurants repeatedly, you know, in a pattern, that could be a signal of human trafficking. And what the credit card companies do regularly already is flag that suspicious activity to authorities who could then possibly investigate if there is a crime related to human trafficking there. Establishing these category codes on gun and Ammunition purchases is a basic and common sense step that would help prevent a future mass shooting or reduce the risk of gun trafficking. So if there's a a pattern where a lot of guns are being purchased at once, and we have seen this in previous mass shootings where there are high dollar amounts of gun sales just within days of a shooting happening, the credit card company could now have this merchant code where they see that those sales are happening and they could flag that to authorities and, you know, potentially try to get ahead of something, you know, horrific happening. Right. I remember the Pulse nightclub shooter bought like $20,000 of guns on his credit card in the day before the attack. I mean, clearly this is what gun activists want to happen, Elizabeth. It it still sounds like it's unclear who would be doing that reporting, right? Because you got credit cards, you got banks. Which of them are willing to do this? Which of them want to do that? But I guess the fact that you can categorize these purchases, wouldn't that worry gun rights groups that have always been nervous about this idea of a national registry of guns that theoretically, they say, would lay the groundwork for having the government taking guns away? Is that a concern? Of course, anytime you hear movement about how to track your purchases, whether it's from authorities or companies themselves, there's going to be pushback from people. They've not defined what suspicious activity is. Is suspicious two guns? Is it three guns? Is it five guns? Is it 5,000? I think one really important thing to understand here, these codes will show where guns were bought, but not what's purchased. Mm. So... You know, you don't necessarily know how many guns someone bought. You don't necessarily know what type, but you would see that there is a pattern emerging. Well, and so what happens next? Because MasterCard and Amex had already said that they do plan to make this change in the purchase code. Visa's joining suit. It almost seems like this is as much of a story about gun violence as it is about a story of political campaigns being waged towards corporations. No doubt, Brad. We have seen growing pressure on corporate America on a lot of political issues, politically charged issues, and guns are one of them. This is an attempt by activists to say corporate America needs to do more when it comes to their role in potentially stopping or having any role when it comes to gun sales. At the end of the day, a lot of guns are purchased with credit cards. So there is going to be pressure not just on the credit card companies, but potentially on the banks that are processing those credit card payments that are processing bank accounts. You know, this is the initial standard being set, the creation of this code. There could still be more to be done when it comes to corporate America and what role they have to play in whether it's gun sales or the broader gun control debate, Brad. Yeah, we've seen these kind of corporate efforts in some other political arenas now, the gun debate. Elizabeth Schulze, great to have you back. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me. Recently, the United Nations gave a dire warning, saying unless something drastic happens, the country of Somalia is about to be hit with a full-fledged famine, meaning there's so little to eat in a country that vast populations simply begin starving to death. With ever-escalating needs and a fifth failed rainy season projected, a further scale-up of humanitarian assistance is critical. If you're trying to picture it on a map, Somalia sits on the eastern tip of Africa, sticks out into the Indian Ocean, just below the Arabian Peninsula. It's got a huge coastline. And while it's been prone to drought before, they've never seen anything like this. So ABC's Matt Gutman, who's been reporting on food shortages in Africa for years now, packed his bags and went to Somalia to find out how a country of 15 million people could be on the brink of mass starvation. He joins us now. Matt, where exactly are you? Uh, we're in a town called Baido, which is southwest Somalia, about uh, 150 miles from Mogadishu. And this is the epicenter of the crisis, Brad. <laughs> Behind me is one of the 70 encampments in Baido, which used to be a small town. It is now one of the fastest growing cities in Africa. There are 600,000 people who fled their homes trying to find some humanitarian assistance here. So it sounds like from both what the U.N. is saying and what it sounds like people are telling you on the ground that a famine is either on the way or it's already arrived. Which is it? 
Well, it's a really good question. So famine is a technical and political declaration, and the country of Somalia is not yet ready to declare that. <laughs> when was the last time they ate meat? Here in Baidoa and across the country, we were far uh, to the north of here, about 500 plus miles, um, and elsewhere. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of dead livestock. There are three and a half million that are dead. I don't remember, he said, because if you look the uh, goats we have, they're too weak. There's yeah. no meat to eat, so no not even you might get sick. Here in Baidoa, we saw um, a nutrition center run by Save the Children, and there were hundreds of mothers outside with their children whose arms are as thick as my finger. What is she trying to say? She, she pointed out her child. There was a mother there, her name was Garen Hassan. She tugged at my shirt to try to get me to pay attention to her, and I, I, I started talking to her. Why does she think that her baby is sick? What leads her to the uh, Diarrhea and vomiting, she became weak. How old is she? Her daughter, 18 months old, was sick and weighs less than 11 pounds. Um, that's less than half of what a child her age should weigh. She's so incredibly thin. What, what's the name of her baby? But her mother said she can't take her because she has all these other children to look after because her husband died on the way wow. to Baidoa. Her husband died on yeah, the way yeah. to try to come to this yes, camp? Yes, because she, the little water they had, he gave to her and the baby. So he died because of her. I'm so sorry. They buried him by the side of the road, so she is looking after the rest of her family. So she's saying she's saying that she doesn't want to go to the stabilization center because she has six children here. Yeah. So she's just going to go. What about the baby? So we went and checked on her again yesterday, and health workers with Save the Children said that those children simply have to go to the hospital right now, or they could die. So she was rushed in a van to what's called the stabilization center, and her kids were given treatment. Mm -hmm. Hi. How are you? Yeah. She feels better? Yeah. I think... Yeah. I'm eating. I am happy. Yeah. 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 So at that nutrition center, a Save the Children official said, if this is not famine, what is? basically saying that, you know, it's been politics for the lack of a declaration. The UN is saying that right now uh, there are over 300,000 people in the highest level of crisis imaginable, basically starving to death. There are over 500,000 children right now who are at risk of dying. Basically, their bodies have broken down. They are too sick to eat, even too weak to cry. 500,000, and if they don't get treatment, it is very possible that up to 250,000 of those children could die. As far as causes, is this just not enough water, not enough, not enough farming? What, what, how does this get this bad? To use a cliche, it is a perfect storm of terrible things. Ambassador, can you explain just some of the factors that are conspiring um, to make this a possibly very deadly situation here. So on the one hand, you have the worst drought on record in Somalia. You have uh, the uh, Russian uh, attack on Ukraine, which has led uh, to very high grain prices, high fertilizer prices, high fuel prices. All of that plays into uh, the food security situation. You have um, humanitarian groups who are just so cash-strapped right now because donor attention has been elsewhere. And you have insecurity. The part of the country where the drought began and is most severe uh, is also the part of the country that has, uh, for the longest time, been under al-Shabaab occupation. Every time we go anywhere, we have multiple armored vehicles. We have guys with AK-47s front and back, about 12 of them, uh, everywhere we go. Uh, and that is not just here, but across the country. I was uh, discussing with a, uh, a woman head of household. Despite the drought, they were able to uh, raise enough crops, have a, uh, enough harvest to keep their family alive for a year. They are in Al-Shabaab controlled territory. Al-Shabaab comes to the farm, takes half of their harvest. So now there's not enough to live. The government of Somalia controls not all of the country. Uh, and that makes getting food and aid and assistance to the people who need it most is almost impossible. So where we are in Baidoa, 
you can only fly in humanitarian aid. You can't drive it in because the roads are controlled by Al-Shabaab. So that complicates things even more. Just devastating scenes in this footage that you've been sending back. All right, Matt Gutman, they're on the ground in Somalia. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. And one last thing. We talked about how intense the mourning has been over the late Queen Elizabeth, but it's gotten to the point where Buckingham Palace should come with a tag. Please look after all these bears. Yesterday, the Royal Park Service, which oversees the grounds near Buckingham Palace, put out an official statement begging people to stop laying teddy bears outside the gates because there were just too many Paddingtons. Well, I hope I don't look weird after all that. The adorable bear, which the story goes, hails from Peru, has become almost synonymous with the queen since her platinum jubilee when she sat down with a CGI Paddington in a video sketch. Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. And what was so delightful about that sketch was it both seemed to capture the queen, this regal woman, not afraid to get a little bit silly, and it captured how her own nation felt about her. Thank you for everything. But that's led to too many Paddingtons, as well as too many people leaving marmalade sandwiches outside. People are just putting them next to the bear. Not only do officials not want food rotting outside the palace, but the new king, Charles, is famously devoted to sustainability. Planet's health today will dictate the health, uh, happiness, and the economic prosperity of generations to come. So, the word from Parks officials is no plastic bags, no teddy bears, and if you bring flowers, they ask they not be wrapped in plastic. Eventually, the palace says the remaining flowers will be composted. Candles are not allowed for safety concerns. They do say cards are welcome, though to keep people's well wishes from piling up too high, they'll be removing them discreetly day by day. In the meantime, among the bouquets, I have a feeling every now and then, there might still be a very rare sort of bear. I'm genuinely curious to know what it's about to smell like seven days after the funeral. That is how long Royal Park says that all these floral tributes will remain in place. A lot more coverage, other royal proceedings in the UK today. Check out abcnews.com or the ABC News app for up-to-the-minute coverage. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7.